So, hello, good morning. How are you all doing? Wow, what a great conference. Uh, it's huge. So many people here. Like, some old faces, some new faces. It's uh, great to be here in Israel. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I want to sort of start off by offering my own thanks to the Blue Hat team. This is one of my favorite conferences, and you guys organize it every year in this amazing way. You manage to get so many people here. You manage to organize such an enormous event. And honestly, the amount of trouble us speakers give to you guys, like, you deserve the real medal. Uh, it's uh, uh, a lot of work. So uh, uh, thanks to you guys. And of course, thanks to all of you who have come to see all of these talks, and also to Microsoft employees who I suspect will be watching it, and to anybody else watching it online. Um, Blue Hat's one of my favorite conferences, and I'm genuinely humbled and honored to be invited to speak at all, never mind to speak first. And speaking first is the best time to speak, because it means I get to watch all of the other talks, and I don't have to worry about my talk whilst I'm watching them. So this is definitely the best place to uh, uh, be giving my talk. So yeah, for those of you who don't know me, that's my name, Pwn All The Things. Matt Tate is the fake name that I have on my passport to go between countries. Um, so most of you will probably know me from Twitter. That's the main place that people know me from nowadays, which is very weird for me, because I don't look entirely like my passport photo there. Um, but yeah, so at the moment, I'm teaching at UT, which is in Austin. I'm very glad to be able to teach people there. Before, I used to work at GCHQ. I used to work at uh, uh, a couple of places that people might have heard of. I used to work at Google Project Zero, which is an interesting organization. Uh, I used to work, well, I was a consultant, so I used to work quite closely with Microsoft as well. So I'm very glad to be back here uh, at a Microsoft conference. And a big shout out, of course, to all of my friends back in Redmond and the Windows security team in particular. So anyway, oh, before I go on, this here is 2014. This is the uh, Israeli-Gaza conflict. And um, this is the two big echo chambers on Twitter, right? Information warfare is about how information spreads. And echo chambers are a good example of how that works. So, it's a pretty picture. So anyway, what is fake news and disinformation, and why do we care about it? Why is it in the news all the time? Right? It turns out it's actually word of the year, according to one of the big dictionaries, which is fake news in itself, because fake news is two words, so they really screwed up there. Actually, they had 10 words of the year. I'm not sure how that works. And one of the other ones was echo chamber, which, again, fake news is two words. Um, so yeah, we have photographs of this guy here, riding a shark. And one of the really interesting things about fake news and information warfare is how much it's in the news for things like Russian trolls. We have things like APT28 hacking into information from things like the, the DNC, stealing all of their emails and publishing them online. This is why we know about all of this stuff. But what I want to tell you about today is that fake news and disinformation is really old. It shouldn't be word of the year in 2017, because we've had this problem for 3,000 years. So I'm going to start off by telling you why this is a really old problem, and I'm going to tell you what's changed, what's new. So first of all, a couple of words that have been in the news. Disinformation. Disinformation. So allegedly coined by Joseph Stalin himself. I don't know whether that's true, but it sounds like a good story. So maybe it's true. From Desinformatia. And the cool thing about it is that according to the story, it is itself disinformation. It is a word that is disinformation itself, because it comes from a Latin root, because they didn't want it to sound Russian. They wanted it to sound French, right? And being a Brit, I can fully endorse blaming the French for our problems. So uh, you know, it's, it's very meta. 
But then the cool thing is that maybe that story is fake. So that would be a disinformation about disinformation being disinformation. So it gets very meta very quickly. Fake news. This has been in the news a lot, right? And this is why, right? This guy, right? Just so you don't think I'm overdoing it, this is every tweet that he's done, well, I haven't checked this morning, this is every tweet that he's done mentioning fake news since January the 1st, right? It's about, that's a lot of fake news, right? So where does this word fake news come from, right? Well, ultimately it comes from this sort of term, it was actually coined by the media, and it was really about clickbait. You know, these sites that invented completely bogus stories just to get people to click on them and then to get money. So basically the onion, but for partisan echo chambers. You know, completely fake things like, you know, Hillary Clinton is secretly a robot, right? Donald Trump's hair is actually a carpet, right? Information, you know, Taylor Swift is secretly an InfoSec pro on Twitter, right? You know, clear, clear fake news, right? But the problem was that we discovered pretty quickly that it doesn't matter how blatantly obvious your clickbait fake news is, people believe it, right? Pizzagate, you remember Pizzagate? So blatantly false. Nobody in their right mind could possibly believe it. But someone did. They went and shot up a pizza restaurant in Washington, D.C. So, Fake news is basically disinformation. There's not really that much between the two of them, right? We might as well just combine them together because disinformation is giving people fake news. It's about misdirecting them. And one of the things that's, I think, important to distinguish is disinformation from misinformation, right? Misinformation is you made a mistake, right? I was misinformed about such and such, right? is that someone told me this thing and it wasn't true. Disinformation is different. Disinformation is about making you believe something that is completely untrue by disinforming you, right? Mis comes from mistake. Dis means opposite of, right? So disinformation is quite different. And then we have this other word, active measures. We hear this a lot in the press, right? You know, it's in the news quite a lot. Active measures is a bit of a superset of disinformation, right? This actually is a very old document. It was released uh, it was from the CIA archives. And we have here a working definition from the interagency process of the US intelligence community, right? So this is the director of central intelligence and the NSA and all the rest of them. They come together and they say, this is our working definition of active measures in the 60s, right? This is old. This is not new. This is not 2017. This is old. This is decades and decades old. It might be new to us, but it is old to the intelligence community. It is old news, right? So what is information warfare? It's basically these three things put together. And what's happening here is the way we make decisions sucks, right? As humans, we suck at making decisions, right? It happens all the time, right? When someone tells you a fact, it either goes into your brain or it doesn't. And the main thing that decides whether or not it goes into your brain is whether or not you already agree with it, right? How horrifying is that? It's about minimizing cognitive dissonance, which is a very long way of saying that we like to agree with ourselves, right? When we have a model of how the world works, right? You go to work in the morning, you earn your money, you come home, like, we know how that works. We also know how politics works. You know, those guys, they get up on stage, they say their spiel, and then they go home and do whatever they were gonna do anyway, right? We all have a model of how the world works. And when new information comes in, we assess the information in light of our model, not our model in light of the information. We don't like cognitive dissonance, right? It makes us uncomfortable, right? It makes me uncomfortable for sure, right? 
This is why I love this topic, because I agree with all of it. It's amazing, right? And so there's a couple of important variants of cognitive bias, but the two main ones for information warfare are tribalism and confirmation bias, right? Tribalism is, or partisanship is, I'm part of a group, right? It might be the Democrats, it might be the Republicans, it might be the privacy activist community, it might be the surveillance community, it might be, you know, whatever community you feel strongly attached to. And tribalism causes us to overlook problems with our side, with the in-group. With the out-group, those guys are bad, right? Everything that the in-group does that sounds like, you know, they probably shouldn't have done that. They were probably doing something, you know, in good faith and they just screwed up a little bit. Right? It happens all the time. You know, someone did something, but they were on my side, so we can overlook that. With the out group, those guys are bastards, right? Every time those guys do something wrong, that's because they're evil, right? It's because they're acting in bad faith. They're terrible people, right? That's what tribalism is. And if you look at, for instance, the United States at the moment, tribalism's pretty good, right? It's pretty strong at the moment. So if you're a Republican, you probably look at Democrats and you think, those guys are just acting in bad faith and are terrible people all the time. Our guys, they're great, right? They always do stuff that's great. If you're a Democrat, you probably have the reverse view. Right? Tribalism is really strong. And confirmation bias is just really a very personal form of tribalism. Right? I have my own views. And if anyone has any information to disprove it, well, they're a bad person, right? or wrong, or worse, both. Right? So that's how these things happen. Right? So one of the things that happens is we have this Great word. It was, it was coined by uh, a guy in uh, the United States. Uh, actually, it probably wasn't coined by this guy, but I'm going to give you the story that it was coined by this guy called Julian Sanchez. And he invented this word called synecdote, which he might not have invented, but whatever. Right? And the synecdote is an anecdote that sounds like it ought to be true, and you agree with it so strongly that you say, yes, this proves that we were right, that my side was right, that the other side was bad. And a couple of weeks later, it turns out that that anecdote was totally wrong. Right? Someone had misunderstood what was going on. It was totally fake news. And you look at that and you say, who cares? Right? Sure, when I thought it was true, this was a really important fact that proved that the out-group was bad and the in-group was good. But now that I know that it's false, well, uh, who cares, right? Because my view wasn't based solely on that fact, so I can discard it. So as information comes into your brain, if it agrees with you, it goes in. If it doesn't, it bounces out, right? This causes partisanship. So anyway, I want to tell you that disinformation is not new, at least to start off with. So I'm going to start off with a very, very old example of disinformation, the oldest information operation I can find. It is an information operation against the gods themselves, right? This is 3,000 years ago, right? 1279 BCE. And Ramesses II, he's the king, right? King of Egypt. And this is this green here is the Egyptian empire at the time. This red here is the Hittite empire. And Ramesses decides he wants to invade, because that's what kings do. And they have this massive fight in Kadesh, right? Which is on the Lebanese-Syrian border. Uh, it's a little bit north of Lake Homs, for those of you who know your geography. And he has a big fight there. And it turns out he kind of screws it up. Right? He comes in with a big army. There's a big army from the Hittites. They have a big fight. They basically fight it out to a stalemate. Right? And it turns out that stalemates are really not that inspiring. Right? If you want to become a god in the afterlife, 
you need to have good battles, not sucky stalemates, right? But it turns out Ramesses, you know, he's got his thinking hat on, and he's thinking, what do the gods know, right? Who knows, right? Maybe they didn't watch the battle. Maybe they weren't paying attention. They were playing on their, I don't know, Xbox or whatever. And this is not very inspiring, so he's going to build his big tomb. And in his big tomb, he's going to have a huge mural to impress the gods. And in his big mural, he gets to paint whatever it is that's going on. And he gets to write what happened in this battle. He's the guy that writes it. He gets to win, right? So this is what he writes. I've summarized it there for you, right? He is the original Donald Trump. Right, 3,000 years ago. Look, his majesty killed them, but his majesty was alone. Nobody accompanied him. He fought this battle by himself. That's how good he was, right? This was in a tomb, right? Who's he trying to impress, right? You know, the workers? Who cares what the workers think, right? This is to impress the gods, right? This is the first information op 3,000 years ago. Here's a more recent one, right? I'm talking about modern disinformation. So now we're up to the Romans. And it turns out, I'll give you a quick, you know, this is uh, Augustus Caesar here on the left. We have Mark Antony on the right. And they have a big spat. And the spat is basically over the fact that Antony helped kill Augustus' dad, who was Julius Caesar, right? It turns out that's a really unpopular thing to do. Don't do it, right? And so. Mark Antony was managing, on behalf of the Romans, he was managing the Egyptian half of the empire. And Octavian, or later Augustus Caesar, was managing the Roman part of the empire. And Octavian really wanted to go to war with Mark Antony to show him his boss. But he needs an excuse. He needs a pretext to go to war. And the pretext he comes up with is the will of Mark Antony. He goes to the Senate in Rome and he says, here, I have the last will and testament of Mark Antony. And it's got three things in it. When I die, the throne goes to some guy, right? But more importantly, my land goes to the children I've had with Cleopatra, right? This is a relationship that caused problems in Rome. But then the third one was the thing that really got him, right? When I die, I'm going to be buried not in Rome, but in Alexandria in Egypt. You can give your land away, but you get buried in the wrong country, that's treason, right? And the Senate's like, that sounds like a fair pretext for war, and they go to war, and eventually Augustus Caesar wins, right? But the cool thing is, this will was completely fake, right? Or at least it's probably fake, we don't really know, but it's probably fake. And so this is a good example of disinformation from a very long time ago. None of this stuff is all that new. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the Soviet Union, right? And it turns out that when you look through information operations for the Soviet Union, it's very easy to end up like this guy, right? I'm not saying it was the KGB, but it was the KGB. It's always the KGB, right? Because if you have the selection bias of the conspiracy theories that we actually knew happened, the problem is that very quickly we end up saying all these conspiracy theories, and they sound crazy. But we actually know that a bunch of them are true. And the cool thing about them is that they're either a conspiracy theory that actually happened, or someone else put a lot of effort into making you think this was a conspiracy theory that really happened, which is itself a conspiracy theory. So it gets a little bit meta for you there. So all of these stories come from CIA declassified sources, you know, a good unbiased uh, set of documents there. Uh, the CIA can be wrong. They often tell me that that's a lie, but they are often wrong. And it tends to err when it errs in a very pro-US, anti-Soviet direction, right? This is, I know this will come as a huge surprise, right? So anyway, information operations are by definition conspiracies, so you have to be a little bit careful, 
right? Conspiracies existing doesn't mean everything's a conspiracy. And you have to be a little bit careful in this field not to see reds behind every lamppost, right? Reds under the bed. This drove a lot of congressmen completely mental in the 60s, right? So the reason I'm going to talk about them is that you need to understand the scale and the purpose of these operations to understand modern operations, to realize that modern operations are not one-off things. They're not these little events that just so happen to have taken place, but actually are this directed effort with significant budget, with significant staffing, and measurable outcomes that they are planning. That we as engineers, when we're thinking about disinformation, it doesn't matter that this was Russia, it matters that people are putting time and money behind these operations, and we need to counter them seriously. So, this is the sort of scale that we're talking about, right? The director of the Central Intelligence Agency, or the deputy director, rather, John McMahon, goes to Congress in 1982, and he says, the Soviet Union is spending $3 billion in 1982 dollars on active measures against the United States, globally around the world. And you have to be a little bit careful about what that actually means. This is Soviet influence operations. Some of this is forgery, some of this is you know, uh, uh, active operations, some of this is bribery. But a lot of it is what we would now think of as disinformation. Three billion dollars is about nine billion dollars in today's money which is about the budget of the NSA, right? This is just on influence operations globally. Like, this is enormous. This is about 10% of Israel's GDP on disinformation, right? This is huge, right? 15,000 Soviets who were working on planting fake news reports, forging documents, mostly in countries outside of the United States to change people's perception of the Soviet Union and of the United States. This is before we had computers. This isn't all that new. So, the big things that they did was they did forging documents and they did planting new stories. Sounds familiar? Right? When has that ever happened, right, in recent history? We need to think of this in terms of how these information operations are planned, who is directing them, and who cares about them, that they're willing to put that kind of resource into it. Because if they're willing to put that kind of resource into it, then actually we need to take this very seriously and not think of this as, you know, they planned this DNC operation, and then they planned this other operation, and there's just one or two of them a year. No. If you have that kind of budget, you have a constant pipeline of operations. You have a huge research department. You're doing you know, huge amounts of planning in order to build up these kind of operations to operate at that kind of scale. So here's a couple of examples, right? First one, US telegram of an ambassador. This was in India. Ambassador Kirkpatrick, who was the UN ambassador at the time, the US ambassador to the UN. And a leaked telegram comes out, ostensibly from the US Information Agency. And it says that the ambassador supports the balkanization of India. Right? Now, I don't need to explain too much about Indian domestic politics, but that was not a popular view in India. Right? And this caused a lot of problems. The US Embassy in India immediately comes out and they says, this is fake news. This didn't happen. And it turns out that it didn't. We have cast iron proof that that telegram was forged. But the Indians you know, in the community saw this document. If they were previously disposed to being anti-US, they were now more disposed to being anti-US. If they were previously disposed to being pro-US, they were a little bit quieter than they were before. This is an information operation that was successful. A document about targeting NATO, right? You know, or targeting Norway with nuclear weapons in a last case, you know, worst case scenario, right? This is not popular view in Norway, as I'm sure you can imagine. 
The third one is a very famous one, is the variant of the US Army Manual, which included a bunch of things like how to torture people. And the US would never torture people, right? Well, at least back then, the US Army Manual didn't allow it, right? It still doesn't, but, you know, back then, this, was, this caused an enormous amount of problems for the US globally. You know, forged telegram ordering the assassination of a presidential candidate. This was in Nigeria. Right, a Nigerian presidential candidate was uh, uh, running for president, and a telegram appears instructing the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria to kill him. Right? This causes some problems. Right? Or forged documents saying the U.S. intended to cause a coup in Greece. Right? Greece at the time, one of the neutral countries between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. This is you know, just five examples of disinformation by planting documents, by doing forgeries, and how successful they can be. But that's in the past, right? This is the Soviet Union before they had computers. This is 21st century information warfare. Does anyone want to guess what that picture is? This social networks. It's the Harlem Shake, 2013. This is people interacting with the Harlem Shake video. I mainly use it because it's pretty, but it's a cool sort of visualization of how different social networks interact with each other when things go viral. You have Twitter, you have uh, things like YouTube, people interacting with each other and sharing information. This is the world now. It no longer looks like a globe, it now looks like a network. And in the event that someone can shape the content that you see, they can shape how you think. That's the danger of information warfare. And when they do that at scale, they can change how populations approach problems. So, when did 21st information warfare really begin? Well, it depends really where you want to look. So in about 2009, for reference, this was the time of Stuxnet. About two years later, the Russian government has an internal document which talks about information warfare and how Facebook is a tool for information warfare, that this is something that could be used in an old Soviet style, right? In the 90s, of course, the Soviet Union had been disbanded. Most of these operations had, you know, ceased to happen or were happening within, uh, you know, either Russia or the, sort of the surrounding area of Russia. This, you know, the West forgot about these activities. But in 2011, the Russian strategic uh, services, they, they start talking about hybrid cyber attacks but they're going to have their cyber attacks. You know, the Russians had been hacking computers since 1995 for espionage. But now they're starting to talk, you know, what if it's not just for espionage? What if we steal some documents and use those documents for disinformation? And they're a big government department. They think of this in 2011. It takes them three years to get around to doing it, right? 2014 starts to hit the tarmac. And in 2015 is when you start to see things like attacks on the Ukrainian power grid and attacks on the Ukrainian election infrastructure itself. 2014, do you remember this? Back decades and decades ago, in the mists of time of 2014, right? This was, a US official was speaking with their counterpart in undiplomatic language. He says, it would be great if the UN would help glue together this deal. And her counterpart says, what about the EU? And he says, the EU, right? And very quickly, this is on YouTube with subtitles in whichever language you want, right? Especially Ukrainian and all the European Union languages, right? This is a phone conversation. Someone had recorded that phone conversation and thought this was a cool thing to put on YouTube for disinformation purposes, right? This wasn't a forgery, and this is one of the important things about disinformation, is disinformation is about changing your perception of the facts 
It's not necessarily about giving you an actual lie. It can mix an actual lie with a whole bunch of truths. It can mix a truth with a whole bunch of lies. It can be entirely lies, or it can be entirely truth, but so far out of context that it changes how you think of it, because the context is the lie itself. This is the difference between you know, a lie versus disinformation. Disinformation is about changing your perception of truth. And 2014, we have the Ukrainian election hack. You remember this? Cyber Burkett. Now, they become a bit more important later, because this is APT28, right? Cyber Burkett attacks the network. And they say, we, Cyber Burkett, have totally destroyed the network and electronic infrastructure of the Ukrainian Central Election Commission. And what they do is they publish who the winner of the election is, Dmitry, Dmitryo Yarosh, who is the right-wing candidate who didn't win the election. But they publish it anyway. And the cool thing is the Ukrainian election officials, they're monitoring their website, and they say, whoops, this isn't the guy who should win. And before it goes live, they turn it off. And then RT says, the Ukrainian election commission has declared this guy the winner. They're working in tandem, right? This is the Russian security services operating information warfare. And then we have TV5 Mond. This is where the Russian security services are starting really to get to the metal of integrated information warfare. Now they're taking over entire TV stations. They're doing this undercover. They're calling themselves the cyber caliphate, right? But we know they're not because we know that they're sharing infrastructure with APT28. We know that they're using APT28 uh, communications protocols. We know that they're using the communications infrastructure of APT28. But they're calling themselves the cyber caliphate and taking over French TV stations. This is what information warfare looks like when it starts to become integrated. And then we get to the DNC hack. Because to understand the DNC hack, we need to understand the history. Right? This is an attack in multiple stages. It's planned, it's executed, it starts in early 2016. And you can just see the progression. This is a big operation. They've planned it in advance. And you can see how all of these aspects belong to the old Soviet model. Right? We're going to target your information. We're going to selectively publish it. We're going to have cutouts for doing the distribution. It takes months to plan, right? And then the breach becomes public on June the 14th. And then, this is the cool thing about Russian intelligence services. They're really agile. They change what happens as they go along. So when the breach becomes public, June the 15th, Gusevar II appears, right? That's 24 hours, right? How many of you have worked in government and can do anything in 24 hours, right? And this is a major, major operation. They set up new social media profiles. They publish a bunch of documents. And they're immediately trying to discredit CrowdStrike, right? And what are they trying to do? They're trying to say, this wasn't the Russian government who hacked this, uh, 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 the DNC. It was some independent group, right? It was just some guy. They got caught out. They were planning to release this information later in the year. Right? They had planned to release it all along, but they were planning to release it at the end of the year, and they had to speed up. And so they had to start off by discrediting CrowdStrike because CrowdStrike did the one thing that they didn't want, attribution. They didn't want these documents to be attributed back to the hack by the Russian government. But then they did something pretty dubious. Cyber Burkett, we remember those guys. They contaminated their distribution networks. DC Leaks was one of their main distribution networks for distributing information for the US elite. Cyber Burkett was for releasing information to Russia and nearby territories. And they hacked this guy, right? in 2013, actually in January 2013, uh, this guy was kicked out of the country. In uh, October 2016, he was hacked. And 
they steal a bunch of his documents and they edit them. They're no longer just interested in doing forgeries. They're now editing documents strategically. And what are they doing? They're removing caveats, right? We're now changing what this says from a document about what our company is doing to what they're doing to shape Russian media. And we can see the deletions. They add things into documents in order to discredit political opponents. And the reason we know that this happened is because they released the same set of emails twice. In one of them, in the CyberBurkut one, they had all the edits. In the DC Leaks one, they didn't. So we can look at them and we can say, what's the difference? Right? That's how we know that they're a forgery. How do we know they're the Russian government? Because these guys are prescient. They know about news stories before they come out. Some of the additions that they have reference a news story that doesn't come out for two days, right, on Russian state media. So they screwed up. But then we get to the postmodern era of disinformation. The DNC hack, you know, was really sort of the, the end of the hybrid model of trying to change your opinion of things. And the postmodern era is really trying to change the way that you consume media at all. And this was really pioneered by WikiLeaks, right, during the DNC hack. Tsunami distributions. This is where they start to just give you such a volume of information that you can't cope with it. So I've spoken with journalists, and what they did, you know, this is, by the way, a timeline. Each row is a different day. This is the WikiLeaks release schedule, right? And at the bottom, this ends at November the 4th. November the 8th is the election, right? WikiLeaks was doing this every day for weeks before the election. It's hard to remember it at this point. But what they were doing was they were flooding the news cycle with these emails. There was such a huge volume of them that people couldn't cope with how much there was. Journalists would come in in the morning and they would say, oh, another WikiLeaks dump. And we know that Donald Trump likes WikiLeaks, and we know that this is causing a big storm and it causes lots of clicks, so we have to go through the latest set to see what's there. And once we've gone through it, we'll write what we found. So that every time that they did this, they would end up with a bunch of headlines. And of course, if you're the victim of this, if you're the DNC, you have the reverse problem. Every day you come into work and a whole bunch of new emails have been leaked. And what you have to do is you have to go through those emails and check whether there's anything dangerous in there that's going to derail your plan for the day. By doing the strategic leaks like this, they completely shaped the media narrative. This was different to the old Soviet way. The old Soviet way was individual stories designed to shape overall the way that you perceive the Soviet Union or the United States or to discredit people that were opponents or to encourage people that were proxies. This is about completely destroying your ability to consume news because it consumes the entire news cycle. There's nothing else that you can see, right? During this period, right at the beginning of the WikiLeaks release of John Podesta's emails was the Access Hollywood tape, which vanished from the news cycle. Why did it vanish from the news cycle? Because there is a fixed amount of attention that news organizations can give to any given story. And when you flood the news like this, you're unable to consume the news properly. This is the same trick that Donald Trump is using now. You forget all of the different scandals. Why do you forget the different scandals? Because there's so many, right? If any one of Donald Trump's scandals happened under any previous president, it would be months of news coverage. But now he's got four of them a day, right? You can't keep up. Right? Who remembers that just three weeks ago he threatened to nuke North Korea on Twitter, right? You can't remember these things because there's just so many of them. This is another trick that they've discovered. Playing to both sides, right? This is the Black Lives Matter protest. One of the things that the Russian government's always been very good at doing is recognizing divisive topics in the United States. They don't really care about which side to pick when they can choose both sides. 
because in the event that we choose you know, blue lives matter and black lives matter and drive them apart, this causes fissures in society. This causes people to lose trust in institutions, to lose trust in each other, to stop seeing each other in terms of good faith, right? You start looking at the outgroup and saying, we know how bad you are, because every day we see in the news how bad the outgroup is, and every day we see in the news how great the in-group is, and over time, that drives society apart. And we've definitely seen this with Donald Trump in the United States, right? You know, the Democrats and the Republicans have never been further apart, right? Partly, that's because of information operations of the Russian government. Partly, it's because of the way the media works, which is itself a non-nation state form of information operation. We don't like to call it information operations because that sounds very you know, bad. It sounds like you know, the type of thing that governments do. But it is. It's basically the same thing. So. What's the future going to look like? Well, the future, we have a couple of problems ahead, right? The first one is we're going to stop being able to trust information that's on the internet, that we can see with our own eyes and listen to with our own ears. When you see Donald Trump say something outrageous in future, or you know, perhaps a different candidate, you're not going to know whether it's true or whether it's CGI. Right? We're already at the point where video games are so realistic you almost can't tell that they're real. Right? It's caught out a bunch of news agencies over the past uh, few years as well. Right? This is a great example where um, basically in real time, by changing his face, so just speaking, he could cause Vladimir Putin to say anything he wanted. Right? Imagine that in reverse, maybe. I don't know. And we also have things like Google now has automatic generation of voice that you can't tell is not a human. It's so good, right? AI has now got to this point where forgeries are easy to create. You're not going to be able to tell that they're forgeries. And this is one of the things that we as technologists are going to have to come to terms with, right? Because this is what the future of disinformation is going to look like. We're also going to have to cope with ransomware changing. At the moment, ransomware is it is an information operation, but it's a really lame one. It's about denying you access to your information. In future, it's going to be about, once we have better techniques, once AI is more evolved, once you have better uh, you know, people developing these ransomware, they're going to start sharing your information. They're going to start exposing it in ways that look like information operations directed at you if you don't pay them money. They're not going to have to charge you $400 for that. They're going to be able to charge you thousands. Right? This is really dangerous, and we're going to need to come to terms with that as an industry. And we're also going to have to come to terms with the fact that information operations are increasingly not just done by governments. They're done by WikiLeaks. They're done by 4chan. They're done by the alt-right. Right? And we're going to see that social media is going to continue to drive divisions, right? Because it's going to drive echo chambers. People already live in like different worlds online, right? If you have one political view, you're probably going to be mingling with people with the same type of political view. And in the event that you're uh, you know, not, then you're going to be on the other side. And you're going to very rarely interact with each other. So we can fix it, thankfully. Or at least we can fix some of it. You know, it's maybe a depressing topic to begin a Tuesday with. This is how everything is broken and everything is wrong. But there's a bunch of things that we can do as technologists. And I'm a little bit careful talking to engineers about solutions. It's usually better to talk to engineers about problems and let them work out the solutions. But here's some ideas that we can sort of go with. One of the big things is automated decisions based on user input. Right? Things like reputation systems, things like automated bans pending an admin checking, right? things like upranking posts because they've had such a large number of retweets that we're going to publish this more broadly. This is admin mode for people with bots. Right? If you are collating community information, that is admin information. There's an admin tool for people with bots. Another thing that we need to do is we need to get better at 
combating forgeries. How do we combat forgeries when we can't trust our eyes, when we can't trust our ears? The answer is metadata, and we need metadata to get better. We need to get to a point where when someone edits a Word document after it has been stolen, we can tell because there's tamper-proofing in the metadata that shows this was tampered with after it was stolen. These types of things will make a lot of these problems less serious in the future because we'll be able to detect them. Another thing is we've seen things like Facebook say, we're going to start you know, asking users whether or not news is true. This is a terrible idea. Right? The whole point of fake news, the whole point of disinformation is users suck at knowing what's true. We need to use objective measures. We need to choose things like, this news story cites these government documents. So it's more likely to be true. Right? Or we're going to surface these documents and let users choose for themselves. Show users the primary documents. Why not? Right? It's a good, good thing to, to learn. And the other thing, finally, before I go off the stage. I think we need to build social media tools that encourage people to engage with views that they disagree with, right? If you have echo chambers where people are just looking at their own views, then, of course, they're going to say, you know, this is the only view that exists and all views that don't conform to this are bad views. So anyway, that's where I'm going to leave it today. So. Disinformation, it's a big deal. It's pretty old. There's some new aspects to it. But a lot of the new aspects are about scale, and they're about combining hacking with production of forgeries. And we can fix a lot of those. So with that, thank you. <laughs>